This building houses the presence of God because we assemble ourselves together and he lives in us and he's in us. Amen. Wherever two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. How many believe that? And even though God dwells in each and every one of us, and we each hear his voice, how many recognize there are times you definitely hear from God? Yes. I mean, by yourself. Yes. He'll bring a scripture to your mind that answers the question or the prayer that you may have prayed to him. Or just a thought comes that you know he's speaking to you. But the scripture declares to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, even the more so as you see the day approach. Because when we assemble ourselves together, God will speak to us in a way that we know the things he has spoken to us individually. How many have ever been in a service and a testimony that has been given, a prophecy that has come forth, the message itself as it's being preached, something that God has spoken to you, a prayer that you may have asked and you've recognized an answer, thoughts that have come to you, you recognize what God has spoken to you individually. Can somebody say amen? And as we assemble ourselves together and the scriptures are read, it validates what God is saying to us. Oh, praise the Lord. So even though each and every one of us, if we know the Lord and God lives inside of us, we're always in his presence. When we assemble ourselves together, it reassures us of what God speaks to us individually. And we need that. Can somebody say amen? Oh, praise the Lord. I want to preach on the day a little bit this morning. But as I go there, I want to reemphasize that the gospel is the preaching of the cross. Religion always wants to base our relationship with God upon our performance. We call it law. Israel was given the law by Moses to show them that on their own, by their own performance, they could never measure up to God's standards. If they could, there would have been no need for blood sacrifices. Amen. The blood sacrifices was given to show them they need to atone for their sins, for the areas in their life where they could not measure up. It was never given for them to keep because the law does not have the ability to make anyone right. right. Because nobody in their natural ability can do it. Nope. Had Adam not sinned in the garden and separated himself from God, there would have been no need for the law. Because man instinctively would have done that which is right out of his love 
towards God. And the reason why man would love God is because he knows beyond a shadow of a doubt God loves him. What religion does is it gives us a picture of God that is based upon our performance. So we get to thinking when we're doing good, God loves us. But when we're not doing good, God don't. Amen? And that works great while we're doing good. But then something comes along and we mess up. And when we do, we don't think God loves us. We got to do something. Now, how many know we do need to change? We do need to repent. When we've made a mistake, we need to confess our sin to him. He's faithful and just to forgive us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we got to change our mind about what we know is wrong. Yep. Amen? Amen. But God loves us no matter what. Amen. Parents, if they're good parents, they may get frustrated. That's a human emotion. Come on. That's the humanity that's in all of us. But they love their children, whether they're good or whether they're bad. My, I don't know why I'm even saying this. My mother, actually my mother's mother, from what I've been told, uh, this, is this is a long time before I ever set foot on this earth. But my, uh, my mother's mother knew the Dillinger family. And they were God-fearing people. But John Dillinger was a bank robber. But, I, but still, even though their son was a bank robber and their parents were godly parents, his parents were godly parents, they still loved him. Now I'm sure it broke their heart and they were disappointed by the things that he was doing. But God, if, if people can do that, how much more does God love us? And in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, and love never fails. The reason people continue to do bad things is because deep down they really don't believe God loves them. The extreme of that is they'll say they don't even believe in him. Because they're trying to get God out of their mind. How many are hearing me? But down deep in the heart of man, whether he has heard the gospel or not, he knows there is something more. He knows there is something more. Other religions are trying all kinds of things to appease this God because they believe he's angry at them. Muslims are killing themselves to appease their God. Killing people. Doing extreme things. Because somewhere inside they believe they have to do something to make themselves worthy. When the truth of the matter is, there's nothing we can do to make ourselves worthy. God gave the law to show us his standards are higher than ours. That his way of living is higher than ours. And that by our own human ability, 
we can never achieve his standards. But his love is even greater. His love came down in the person of Jesus and paid the price. I know this is basic, basic, basic teaching. But you know what? It's so basic most of the church can't get it. They have to have some kind of an angry God in order for them to try and do right. And it never works. All I can put on a religious face Sunday morning. How many know we have all been good at that? Oh, put on, you know, put on our nice face and look like we're just having no problems at all. Like the time, and I know I've told this story hundreds of times, like the time I went to church and boy, I'll tell you what, I was a worshiper. You could hear my voice above everyone else's. Still can sometimes. And old Bill Britton got up to preach and he said, you know, there are some people, you look at their lives when they come to church and you think they're, they don't have a problem in the world. Why, you can hear their voice above everyone else's voice when, when they're praising the Lord. And would you know, before church, they got into a knockdown, drag out fight with their wife. <laughs> that particular Sunday morning, we had. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. But God still loves us. Oh, praise the Lord. God still loves us. The law, the ritual, all ended when Jesus said, it is finished. That old covenant was brought to an end. And a new covenant was brought into existence. Paul says this, and I'm going to read this probably uh, more of it a little bit later. If I can find there, I got so many uh, scriptures I want to get to this morning. I'll just have to, find, I'll find it. Oh, praise the Lord. It's in Galatians. And it's one of these places I've got marked, but I've got hundreds of places here marked. <laughs> it's almost hard to find where I'm wanting to go because I've got so many places already marked that I don't know what I'm... Well, yeah, we're going to get to some of that, but I'm going to. Well, in verse 21 of chapter 2, he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead. Then Christ is dead in vain. But that's not the one I'm wanting. I want where he says he glories in the cross. Oh, praise the Lord. Father, help me find this scripture. I don't know why I can't find it. Well, I am. God turn the pages. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Yeah, that the uh, No, it's not that either. But yeah, but it don't have the cross. The cross is verse 14. Okay, I, I will read verse uh verse uh, 13. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that you may be that you may glory in your flesh. 
But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Well, I had it marked, but I, but I didn't underline it. And so, because there's some other scriptures in that same chapter I'm going to deal with this morning. Praise the Lord. But that's an important scripture. Because if you understand what he is saying, is I have no confidence in the law. I have no confidence in my fleshly, natural lineage. I have no confidence in all the things that I were trained in. Amen. Though Paul benefited by him because the Spirit gave him understanding. He needed that training. But his confidence was not in anything of the old religious order. His confidence was only in one thing. This was the center of his gospel, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ. What he did on the cross is our whole basis for our relationship with God. And it's true whether we believe it or we don't believe it, but we'll never enter into it until we believe it. Can somebody say amen? amen. As long as in your mind God is mad at you, as long as you got to prove yourself to God, as long as you're dependent on any kind of your own performance, you're not really believing the gospel. You can be completely out there in the world and in darkness completely, or you can be religious Amen. and know that Jesus is your Savior, but still be basing your relationship with God upon your performance. When Paul said, I'll glory only in, only in the cross of Jesus Christ. What is the cross, it's not the wood that he died upon. The cross is he who was without sin became sin and died fulfilling the law. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. He died. When he died, our sins were completely paid for. Every single sin that we ever did or will do, it was paid for. What about blasphemy of the Holy Ghost? Isn't that the unforgivable forgivable sin? No. He says, King James says, says that uh, whosoever blaspheme of the Holy Ghost hath no forgiveness in this age or the age to come. The word there is never. But when you look it up in the Greek, it's aeon. Doesn't mean that they'll never ever be forgiven. It means they're not going to be a... Because what is blasphemy of the Holy Ghost? It is something that you know is of God and you're saying it's of the devil. Not something you're doing ignorantly. Something you are doing purposely. There were many of those many of those priests and religious leaders of Jesus day knew who he was. But they did not want to lose their political religious world that they had built. And so rather than to lose the people to follow after Jesus and having their world crumble, they purposely 
they purposely said that what he was doing was of the devil. Yep. That's what they said. So you cast out devils by the power of Beelzebub. Jesus said, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a house be divided against itself, it shall not stand. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, who do your children cast them out by? They knew what he was doing was of God. Remember in, in John chapter 3, Nicodemus. You know, Nicodemus was a priest. Yes, he, was. he came to Jesus secretly. How many ever catch that? Oh, yeah. He came to him secretly. He didn't want, yeah. anybody he didn't want anybody to know. He was sneaking down to hear that. He was sneaking down to get among some of them kingdom people to hear that message. You'd be surprised who sneaks among us sometimes to hear this message. And not, to, and not personally to come against it. But they're receiving it and knowing the truth. But because they do not want to lose their position in the religious order they're in, they don't want anybody to know. And they'll get up Sunday morning and they'll preach the status quo that everybody else is preaching to hold on to that position when inwardly they know. You'd be surprised who has come and heard this message. Now some purposely came to tear it down. How many ever heard of, uh, I, I, I might not pronounce his name not right, uh, I think it's, uh, Dave Wilkerson, crossing the switchblade? I mean, real famous preacher, did a lot of good things. Well, he snuck among us. He became a friend to Kelly Varner. He met Bill Britton. He began to, uh, he began to, you know, Hear, hear the, uh, he began to hear the message, but when he but he knew it was not popular, so publicly he then came against us, said we were all new age, and uh, I'll tell you what, it's a dangerous thing to do that, but now, and that would. If he, unless he really believes we are all of the devil, if he really knew that what we're saying was was God, that's borderline blasphemy in the Holy Spirit. Now, does that mean he he'd be lost? No. What it means, he loses out on being a part of it. How many hear me? He's losing out on being a part of it. Because he knew what was of God, was of God, but he said it wasn't of God. Yep. Now, I don't know that he did that. Uh, how, I want you to hear, how many are hearing me in balance? Bounds. He could have, he might, he might actually believe we are the enemy and he's exposing the enemy to the Christian world. But there are those around that I personally know. They come around us, they hear the message, they can preach the message. They've got it so much in them. But they go back to their denominations and they preach the same old junk. Same stuff. They're chameleons. We talked about one of these preachers just the other day. Yeah. Whatever environment, whatever environment they're a part of, they blend right in. But I'll glory not except for in the cross Amen. of Jesus Christ. On the cross, my sins were paid for. Whether I'm good, whether I'm bad, God loves me. My sins were paid for by his blood. Now, when I believe that and know that he loves me, 
I start loving him. I start loving him. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will be keeping my commandments. It's a natural course. Something's going to happen with your desires. There's a new influence that comes in. You're not going to be doing the same old things you were doing before. And it's not because somebody's beating you over the head and telling you you need to quit doing this and do this. You're, you're going to know what you need to quit. Yes. Now, I'm gonna, I'll still preach on what sin is. Amen? I mean, I'll preach on what's wrong and I'll preach on what's right, but I can't enforce you to do what's right. Amen. That's the job of the Holy Ghost. Yes. All I can do is tell you. But what I'm also going to tell you is irregardless, God still loves you. And he'll never leave you nor forsake you. And he's going to keep influencing you till you do right. The power of God is in the cross. On the cross, not only did I receive forgiveness... Not only were my sins paid for on the cross, the old person that I was, the old man was crucified with him. Absolutely. I am not the same old person that I once was. It is possible because of the flesh that I live in it is possible if I'm in the right situation, I can be tempted to lie. And in that situation, there may be a time I give in to that. But in my heart, I can't live that way. How many know what I'm talking about? Amen. You know, before I came to know the Lord, hey, if it got me out of trouble, great. But that's not who I am now because something inside of me just can't be that way because I want to be honest. Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. Where I may have been prejudiced or hated someone, I find myself now I can't be that way. It's not the person that I am. How many are hearing me? Amen. I can't find it in me to mistreat another person. Now, that doesn't mean that in the flesh is not that ability to do so. But if I do, I'm not comfortable with that. How many know what I'm talking about? So you know what happens? I change. I change. Where I used to be comfortable doing things that I knew was wrong, I'm not comfortable anymore. Because it's not in my nature. I am a new creature. On the cross, one died for all. Therefore, Paul says, all are dead those of us that believe that start experiencing it we do become a completely different person than what we were before the law couldn't do that love and grace is the only thing that can accomplish that the cross paid for our sin. Aren't you glad? Amen. With all that said, I want to begin this morning's message. <laughs> Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But of, for, in verse 1, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. 
For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Remember that scripture. That's important. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us sleep. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober for they that sleep sleep in the night and they that be drunken are drunken in the night first of all what I'm wanting to say is the day has nothing to do with time Amen. the day has nothing to do with time when he's talking about being awake, being watchful, watching, he means be aware of who you are, yes. of what you are. The word day means light. Let me go to Genesis chapter 1 real quick. Now I'm going to come back here to Thessalonians. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. What is day? Light. He called the light day. And darkness he called night. The evening and the morning were the first day. Now, I'm not getting into the days of creation. I want to get into one basic concept, and that is day means light. Light means knowledge and understanding. Amen? Amen. That makes it practical. Do you know there are hundreds of Christians that really don't know what walking in the light really means? Light means knowledge. I'm going to do something real quick here. Now, I know you might have this room memorized. Uh, what's up front in the uh, southwest uh or no, I'd be the, yeah, the southwest corner. Yeah, there's some drums up there. But if you were just, if you, if you just came in here, you wouldn't know where the chairs are. You wouldn't know where anything is. You're in darkness. You're in ignorance. You could walk and trip right over a chair. You have no knowledge. Now you know where everything is. See, now I can walk this way because I know this way is clear. But you know, if I'm back here or I'm over here and I'm thinking I'm walking straight because I can't see what I'm doing because I don't know everything in dark, I could be walking like this and just... 
I had no knowledge at chairs there. Light makes manifest. Those who are in darkness don't know the path in front of them. They don't know who they are. They don't know what they are. Because it takes knowledge and understanding. Amen? And so most of the religious world are hung up over events that they think are going to happen. And every generation has preached we're in the end times. World's going to end. Every generation, man's been messing with stuff. Obama and those that are messing with stuff today, they ain't no different than those who have messed with stuff in the past. There's always been somebody trying to mess with stuff. Amen? We can get all caught up in trying to change things politically that need to be changed. Or we can walk in a completely another world and let this world see it. Because ultimately... God's in charge. Yes. Amen. What if everything people are doing out there, say the government completely takes over, the only way you're going to make it is to be one of the big shots. What if in the midst of that, people that are just walking in God's ways, their lives are prospering anyway? Man, in Egypt, the children of Israel were slaves. Yep. Well, what is it that the elite of today are wanting to do? The globalists, those that are uh, wanting to uh, take over our country and create socialism and all these. Well, they're just wanting to enslave, yep. take away our freedoms, and make us slaves. Exactly. Well, the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt. But guess what? When there was darkness in Egypt, there was light in the land of Goshen. Yes. When, the, when the Egyptians were plagued, the Israelites worked. Amen. When the blood was applied to the doorposts of their heart, the blood of the lamb, the, uh, the doorposts of their house, Symbolizes to us the door of our hearts. When the death angel saw the blood, he passed over. And their firstborns weren't killed. The ones that were enslaving them because they didn't know, didn't apply the blood. Therefore, their firstborn was destroyed. You know what Pharaoh said? Get these people out of here. Give them their freedom and let them go. Yeah, he changed his mind. He came after them to destroy them. Did he destroy them? No, God backed them up into a corner. The only way out, the Red Sea. God spoke to Moses, command the sea to part. The sea parted and they walked across on dry ground. Well, Pharaoh said, well, if they can do it, we can do it. Let's get after them. I'll tell you what, it might have looked kind of bad for those in the end of the line, but you know what happened when they made it on shore? Water's the waters closed. Down. Pharaoh's army Down. was not a problem anymore. How many are hearing me? Amen. I know. I'm not. I'm awake to what's going on today. Maybe not as awake as some others, but what I'm more awake to, to 
is my relationship with God and who and what I am. And I don't care what they're doing. I'm going to be who I am and what, and what I am is going to have a change upon this world. Can somebody say amen? And so I will not even, I don't even need to burden my mind upon all those things because those things have been going on forever. I mean, you had a Nimrod. Come on. There ain't nobody doing anything different than what Nimrod did. You had world empires ever since where most of humanity was enslaved. All that we're seeing now is the same old, same old European aristocracy trying to rule everything. Just like they did in the feudal system. A little more, uh, what could I say, sophisticated. But it's the same thing. But that has nothing to do with those whose trust is in God. Amen. Well, what if we find ourselves in a concentration camp? Joseph found himself in prison. Yes, and you know what? Yes, he, he prospered in prison. Yes, he, he was actually free in prison. Yes, and finally, it was noticed. It may have took a long time. You know, God don't do things the way we think they ought to be done. We want them done right now. Yep. Instant generation. There's people who don't like to take the time for their coffee to be brewed. They want instant coffee. I don't care I mean, that, whether you have instant coffee or not. I'm just talking about we're an instant generation. Yep. Pop it in the microwave. Yep. Go down to McDonald's and get poisoned. Oh, praise the Lord. And it's fast. We get it right now. Except for we got to stand in all the lines. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. And God doesn't work that way. He's not in a hurry. And you know, you just might find out when we get out of that hurry mentality, we just might start putting on immortality. We think everything's got to be done right now. Right now, right now. All we need to do is to walk in who we are. What we need to be preaching is grace and love and the cross. When we get in on our mind that God simply loves us, we start loving him back and we start changing. We give other people that same opportunity. That's freedom. Well, didn't the scripture say, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free? No, something that man wants to be in bondage. Take all our guns away from us. We'll be safe then. No, I guarantee you, those that want to find a gun will find one. Amen. Those that are doing crimes don't have their guns legally. They have them illegally. Amen. Take all the guns away and get rid of them. They'll find some other way. Amen. The problem isn't the gun. The problem's in the heart. Amen. Now, there's a lot of people that own guns, like to shoot them, like to have target practice. Some don't even like to hunt. They, only, they won't even kill an animal. They just like to shoot at a target. Yep. Then there are those that like to hunt. How many know we still got to feed these bodies? Some people need to hunt for food still. And they would never think of using their gun on a human being. Unless maybe a human being come in to attack their family or come on, how many are hearing me? Amen. 
But whenever there's freedom, somebody is going to abuse that freedom. And just because somebody abuses that freedom, does that mean everybody should be in bondage? But you know, that's the way religious people think too. I'm using guns as just, as, as just an illustration. You preach freedom. You preach grace. And people are going to say, you're giving people license to sin. You're letting people do things that are wrong. No, we're not. But you know, somebody is going to. Somebody's going to hear what they want to hear. Yep. Somebody's going to make it license for, for their sin. And so they're going to say, you just can't. You got to have some law. But law frustrates the grace of God. Grace can't accomplish its purpose if we believe something that's not true. And to believe God at any time doesn't love us is not true. Oh, praise the Lord. Light is knowledge and understanding that that old order of law, that old order of religion that tries to force you to do what's right by human ability is gone. It ended at Calvary's cross. The cross itself is what brought salvation. Yes. It is understanding what the cross does that causes us to change. Amen. Learning to know who and what we now are. How many know that in, in, in Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and I'm just, I was, this wasn't on my list to preach, but I want to, or not 13, 17. It says that, God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of, of him. The eyes of your understanding being what? Enlightened. You know what that word enlightened means? It means you see the light. What's seeing the light mean? It means you have knowledge. You have understanding. He's opened up the eyes of your understanding. Well, if he's opened up the eyes of your understanding and you have been enlightened, you have knowledge, you have understanding, then what are you walking in? The day. You are children of the day and not, not children of the night. Oh, praise the Lord. Aren't you glad? Well, with all that said... I want to go to Matthew chapter 21, I believe it is. And I want to lay your heart to rest about some things. Now, how many have ever heard that Matthew 24 is just now starting to be fulfilled. And so we're looking for wars and rumors of wars. Guess what? There's always been wars and rumors of wars. We're looking for earthquakes. I got news for you. We've always had earthquakes. We're looking for 
kingdom rising up against kingdom. We've always had kingdom rising up against kingdom. We're looking for those of us on the rooftop better not run down and get... That doesn't even make sense today because we don't live in those type of houses. In ancient Jerusalem, their houses, their entrance was on top. You went upstairs to their rooftop. Their rooftop was their porch. How many have ever seen... Uh, Indiana Jones, uh, what was the first one, the Raiders of the Lost Ark? Where were they sitting at? On the rooftop. That's the way they're, the, 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 they live back. And, and yeah, the, over there in that area, they, they still live in houses like that. But most of the world don't. So he's saying those on the rooftop, let them not go back down in the house, but let them flee. Well, that'd be stupid for us. Because you stop and think, how do you get down if you're on the rooftop? If you're on the rooftop, don't go down into your house. Well, how do I get out of the house? Well, the entrance to their houses was on the roof. They went down their stairs. Oh, and pray that your flight... Be not in the winter. Though, and pray that your flight be not when you're with child. Do you know all these things that Jesus was talking about there in Matthew 24 was fulfilled in 70 AD? All of it. We'll get into that in a, in a moment. I really ain't preaching on Matthew 24, but I want to say some things. All the fear monger preaching that is being done today is getting a sidetrack from the truth. Yes. That's, what it's, that's what the enemy wants, wants to do, get sidetracked. Everybody's worried about end times. And, and when they read the book of Revelation, they don't even get what it's talking about because there's a, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Not when the Antichrist is going to come. The mark of the beast, what is it? Well, it's your social security number. They're going to tattoo it in your head and upon your arm. And, and, and you'll go through a scanner just like your foods are being going through a scanner right now. They don't understand Bible symbology, because they've never been taught it. They read it, with a natural mind. they read it with a natural mind. There's this computer in Brussels. Well, that was actually a generation ago they preached that. I think we've now it's a scanning system, all kinds of things. And, and, and people are paying attention to all these things and missing the most important part, the knowledge of who they are now in Christ and being aware of his presence where he is. We're so busy one day wanting to die and go to heaven or be caught up in a rapture that one day we might actually meet Jesus. And Jesus is inside saying, when are you going to wake up? I'm here. Why don't you have a relation with me now? now? I'm what heaven is. I'm not a man anymore. I'm God. Can you imagine standing in line waiting to spend some time with Jesus? There's billions of us. We're talking about from the beginning to the end. Let alone just the amount of people that are here right now. Well, only a portion of us is going to be saved. Well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that. Well, then there's at least a million or two of us. We're talking about uh, believers now. There's at least a million or two believers out of the billions of humanity that are here, wouldn't you say? And it takes all day at a theme park 
to get on our favorite ride because there's hundreds of people in front of us. Well, maybe I won't be in the last part of the line. Well, I hope I don't go by alphabetical order. <laughs> My last name is Wallace. <laughs> My Jesus is not confined in, an, in one individual body. He took that body into heaven and there he dispersed himself as spirit to live in every single one of us that will allow him to come in. Oh, hallelujah. And he's there. He's there. We just need to awaken ourselves to him, learn to hear his voice. Oh, praise the Lord. But any of us that preach this, what did uh, Lynn Howe said? He knew he was, he was doing something right because now he's on the top 10 of the false prophets list. <laughs> because we want hype. We want hype. We want to know what's going on in Jerusalem. We want to know about all the, the, the wars and everything that's going on. We want to know all this stuff. And we can know all that stuff and be walking in darkness because we have no relationship with the Lord. And consequently, when you get so far into that kind of thinking and you see how hopeless it, it appears to be, then the only thing you can do is hope to get out of here. God didn't put us here to get out of here. He put us here to make our mark, to change the world around us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Oh, praise the Lord. Well, let me get into Matthew chapter 21 and verse 42. I want to start reading. Remember... He said, the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. He also said, but you are not children of the night, but ye are children of the day that that day should not overtake you as a thief. What? does a thief do? He comes in and takes things away from you. Amen? There was a time we were out of town. While we were gone, a thief broke into our house and took some things that belonged to us. A thief comes to steal, to take away. Paul writes that the day of the Lord is as a thief in the night. He comes while you're in darkness. He comes while you're ignorant. When you don't know the truth. Amen. Okay. Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 2. Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builder rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Is that what your scripture says? And 42 it does. 40, 4, 43. I read 42 and then went to 43. Uh, I started in 42. You said two. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, how many read verse 42 and 43? Okay. Right page. Sorry about that. He said, the kingdom of God 
shall be taken from you. What does a thief do? Comes in and takes. You see, the kingdom of God was given to Israel. Now, we have we discussed in the past, ten of those tribes were given a bill of divorcement, and they were dispersed. The kingdom of Judah was all that was left of the kingdom of Israel as far as the covenant is concerned and the kingdom of God. But they were still wanting to practice their religious order when the change that was prophesied throughout Scripture had come. Amen? Their Messiah, their Christ, had come, but they still wanted to continue with the law, with their religious programs, with that which they had built, and how many know it was not producing righteousness? In fact, it was corrupt. Jesus said, do what they say, but don't do what they do, because they say and do not. Amen? Religious world, that's what it's like. They'll tell you how to live, they'll tell you how to do it, and they themselves that are telling you how to do it ain't doing it. So he said, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth fruits thereof. Turn with me to 2 Peter real quick. Actually, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. I'm going to start in verse 8 because he's talking about the same thing Jesus was talking about there in Matthew 21. Actually, go to verse 7. Oh, good grief. I could go up to verse 6. Verse 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, Precious, he that, is, that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe. Did he say unto you, therefore, who are Jews? Now, I want you to be with me here this morning. He didn't say you who are Jews. He said unto you therefore which believe he is precious and unto them which be disobedient the stone which the builders dis disallowed the same is made the head of the corner now I want to stop here most people don't get what the cornerstone is he's talking about a pyramid it is the head of cornerstone, which Ephesians 2 says the whole building fitly framed together groweth up unto. How many know the, 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 the chief cornerstone of a pyramid is a, is a complete pyramid itself? That's why he's using the pyramid as an example because you see, we're all to be like him. We conform unto his image. He is our example. And he purposely uses the pyramid of Giza as an illustration because it was a pyramid built without a capstone. Without a chief cornerstone. Because you see, that's what that religious order was. That's what we all were without him. We're incomplete. incomplete. Amen? Amen? But now the chief cornerstone has come. Yes. But they can tell 
by his message. He is radically different than what they conceived him to be. Amen. That he is preaching something totally different than what they are. What they were doing was just a type, a prophecy, making them aware that they without him can do nothing. But they thought their religious system was all they needed. And they would not hear his message. They would not change. Therefore, that great pyramid that was built there hundreds, thousands of years ago was built there prophetically. Because when he would come, they wouldn't want to receive him. Just like the builders of that pyramid didn't want to put a capstone on it. And so he said, so he says, let me read that verse again. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them that are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of a corner, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, wherein to also they were appointed. You know the way most people preach that? Well, that's people that they don't want to quit drinking. They don't want to quit cussing. They don't want to quit doing. Now, come on, we need to quit all that stuff. Can somebody say amen? amen. But what he's really talking about is that religious world that did not want to change from that ritualistic system of the law and accept the one that it was prophesying about. Yes. They wanted to hold on to their old order and they were disobedient. They stumbled at the word. Still doing it today. And that's why Jesus said, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation that'll produce, that'll bring forth fruit, that'll change. Verse 9. Well, which stumbleth at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Now verse 9. But ye, turn around and say, but you, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. That should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. My God. He has already come. The day of the Lord has already come as a thief in the night. It took the kingdom of God away from that old religious order of Judaism. And it brought it to a nation, the church, the believers, who are both Jew and Greek. Jew and Gentile of the other nations. Who has made us all a new creation. There's no room in this new creation for those that want to make a difference between Jew and Gentile. There are not first and second class citizens. We're all fellow citizens together. Aren't you glad? Amen. Therefore, I, don't, I to, t to tell you the truth, I don't care what's going on over there in Jerusalem. Except for what God's doing. And, you know, I don't think, and this is, dang, I know this, some people take me wrong, but if Israel, do, if the nation Israel today over there is doing something wrong, I don't think we need to support the wrong they're doing. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now, if what they're doing is right, I think we need to get behind them. Can somebody say amen? amen. But they're a nation like any other nation. 
except what God is doing in the midst. And, with, and the God that's doing something in the midst of Jerusalem over there is doing something in the midst of Jerusalem over here. Oh, praise the Lord. Now, I am not anti-Semitic. I'm not anti-Jew. I'm inclusive. We need to get our eyes off some geographical location and get it on our heavenly location. Our relationship with him here right now. Oh, praise the Lord. And verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Oh, praise the Lord. Let me just read a few other scriptures and I'm going to bring this to a close. How many has got something out of this this morning? Because still today, you can turn on that television and they're going to tell you that the Jew over there is God's chosen people. Well now, in Christ, they are. Can somebody say amen? amen. But in Christ, you are. We are. There is no distinction. And, I get, and there's only, only the blood of Jesus cleanses them from their sin. Amen. Not the ashes of a red heifer. Not the blood of a red heifer. If God, if, if, if God allowed animal sacrifice again, that would trod down the blood Jesus shed on Calvary's cross. Absolutely. There are not two ways of salvation. There is only one way. And that one way makes us all one people. Oh, praise the Lord. And God is after prospering you as much as he's prospering anyone else. All that believe and put their trust in him. God wants to move in them. Let me read in Romans chapter 2, and I'm going to, and, and 9, and I'm going to bring this thing to a close today. In Romans chapter 2, I thought I'd underlined it, but I didn't, but it's okay. I know where the scriptures are. Verse 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. Do you know the Jew of that day, as well as the Jew of today, their total trust is in their lineage and in the circumcision. Now medically, how many know most, most male children when they're born are circumcised. But in that day, it was a religious uh, it, was a, it was a religious covenant and a signet. And if you weren't circumcised, you were not part of the people of God. And Paul's preaching the cross that reconciles us all to God by what Jesus did. But then the Jewish Christians that is, those who accepted Jesus, but they didn't want to leave behind the old religion. Their trust was in the circumcision. They were just trying to add what Jesus did to what they were doing. You know what, religious do, what religion does? Tries to add Jesus to what they're doing. Well, what we're doing has nothing to do with it. It's what Jesus did. And what Jesus did causes us to change. Oh, praise the Lord. But if you weren't circumcised, and so Paul's worst enemy were those who come behind him trying to uh, uh, preach circumcision. And Paul says in verse 29, verse 29, verse 28, he is not a Jew that is one outwardly, neither is he that the circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly and the circumcision that of the heart 
in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Is this clear? Romans chapter 9. I'm going to read in verse 3. I'll read in verse 1. Paul was not anti-Jewish. He was Jew himself. I am not anti-Jewish. But our hope is what Jesus did. And Paul had a heaviness of heart because his people wouldn't hear the truth. Jesus said he came to his own and his own received him not. But many received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God. But let me get here in verse, verse 1 in, in, in Romans 9. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom is concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. But listen to verse 6. But not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. How many are reading there? Now I can take that in two different ways. And they're both true. But they both come to the same conclusion. Just because your lineage is Israelite. Just because you were born a Jew, that doesn't make you Israel of today. They are not all Israel who are of Israel. Then he goes on to say, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now here is where some of our white supremacist people who preach what we call British Israel and I, I believe a lot of the things that they say and preach as far, as far as historically. But because they say, well, just because you're Abraham's seed doesn't, it's only in Isaac. And that's true. But Isaac here is a child of promise. Yes. Isaac was a child that naturally should never existed. God told Abraham in his old, well, he told him when he was a young man. But it seemed like uh, Sarah just couldn't have a child. Well, Sarah got the bright idea, well, I'm too old, I can't bear children. But my handmaiden can. That'll be your seat. I'll just, well, how many all that did was cause problems. Amen. That was not a child of the, promise that was a child of the flesh they got in there and thought they'd help God out but he said no in Isaac shall thy seed be called I promised you a son I'm going to give you a son it's not Eliezer somebody that's not of your loins not Ishbel who I'll bless but I but it's through Sarah that you're going to have this child. Well, now there are, Abraham's 100 years old, Sarah's 99. 
the angel of the Lord comes as three men, and they say, and they say that he's going to have a son, that Sarah's going to give birth to a son about this time next year. She laughed. Shall I have pleasure in my old age? Abraham's got to be nuts to believe in these guys. It ain't going to happen. Well, it wasn't dependent upon Sarah's faith. It was dependent upon Abraham's faith. And the fact if God says something, he's going to do it. Isaac symbolized that. He is the promise of faith. He said to us, he would put his spirit within us and cause us to walk in his ways. Well, if his, if his spirit is in us, we're going to walk in his ways. It ain't because he's going to beat us up to get us there. You know, that's, the way, that's the way we want to preach. Well, you know, we'll get there, but God's going to have to bring us through a knot hole backwards and beat us up, make us suffer, da 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 No, it is his love and his influence that when we awake to that, we start changing. Oh, hallelujah. That suffering message. Now, we do suffer sometimes. Come on, we're tested. But we, 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 we just replace the law with suffering. It's like... The more we suffer, the better we are. No, suffering is just trying to get our attention. And suffering just kind of sometimes just sets us up for the glory of God. Amen? But it's his love. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. Isaac is a picture of Jesus. Because after Isaac is born, what does God tell Abraham to do? Take thy son, thy only son Isaac, and sacrifice him. You know what Abraham does? He obeys God. In Abraham's mind, God was going to raise him from the dead because he knew that was the promise. It was through Isaac his seed would be called. It was through Isaac he'd be the father of many nations. Notice he said many nations, not one. Because this thing is going to engulf all nations. So he's obedient. But as he comes down, and you know, Abraham knew something because he told Isaac, God will provide a sacrifice. And as he's ready to bring down the killing stroke, God stops him. I was just testing your faith. And there they found a ram caught in the thicket. But Isaac was symbolic of Jesus who would die. But who would be raised from the dead and redeem us. So he goes on, he says in verse 7, back in Romans 9, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are of they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Is that what your Bible says? But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Oh, praise the Lord. We are not God's chosen because we were born in the right race. We were born as God's children because we believed the promise. And those of us that are born of that promise are today the Israel of God. Whether we're children of the, whether our lineage is Jewish, whether our lineage is Indian, Native American, whether we're Af our, our, our roots are African, Wherever our roots are, 
we're born of another seed. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. The seed of promise. And we didn't get there because we could line up on our own. We got there because we knew we were bankrupt. We didn't have the ability. But we accepted what he did. And he is coming to our lives. And he is influencing us. He is changing us. And when we mess up, he is a loving father. He forgives us because the price was paid until that love so consumes us, we bring every enemy underneath our feet Amen. and we walk in the same power, authority, and ability that he does. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when we hear things on the news, I believe we got the authority to say, Lord, intervene here. Intervene here. Change this. Drive by a wreck. Lord, let, let the damage be healed. Let the damage be healed. Property, that can all be restored. Let the let their injuries be healed. Put them in God's hand. We can speak yes. to situations around us and we can change. Yes. I remember walking into Quick Trip and a girl that, that, was, that worked uh, uh, on the, the fuel desk on the truck side uh, was sick one day and I, I can't remember what it was. And I just, I, I didn't really pray. I just said, well, that's got to go. And that's all I said. She knew I was a preacher. I come back later that day and she's all excited. You know what? After you said that, I was well. It's gone. I'm, doing, I'm feeling great. Now, I can't say this happens every time, but, you know, exercise. Walked on Jim's car lot and, well, well that car's going to sell. You know what? It's sold. Now, every time I say that, it don't happen. But I'm, don't worry about the times. It doesn't. Just keep doing it. Oh, praise the Lord. And when we do, we start having an impact. And people start noticing. And, and especially when you're not condemning and judging them. But they see... You're doing what's right. You're not, you know, it's easy to not condemn somebody, you know, when you're messing up as bad as they are. And sometimes we have to get to that place for us to learn the lesson. Can somebody say amen? amen. Now, I'm not advocating we need to mess up, but I'm saying sometimes God lets us mess up to let us know we can't do it on our own. But when they see us doing what's right and we're not looking down the nose at them and we're just telling them, Jesus loves you. In reality, see, we religiously, we have said that for years. Well, Jesus loves you. <laughs> you know, I mean, God is love. But my God, how much of it was actually practiced in the church? Well, praise the Lord. That's, that's my message for today.